to start off. Actually, I'm fine with you having your computer open, but I actually did something for you. Actually. Uh, you go here to the, the lovely wiki space. Has everyone done that before? Oh, or mean green workshops dot wikispaces dot com. The beauty of this lecture is that you don't need to write anything down because it's on here. And you can follow along or you can skip ahead if you want. But you just go to the GSQ lab because we're the best lab. Yeah. And you click on this. You can always go to the blog because the blog has good stuff. But you can click on this little Mexico link here. Oh, huh. there's a lecture. So if you're on Facebook, you have no excuse. All right. So. Miguel? Yes. Is it moving? Is mine moving? One thing that I did was I gave you a little survey about Mexico to try to get what you thought was going on with Mexico. These are weighted by their frequency of which you said them. All right, so what do you think the most common word is? Drugs. 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 All right, then what? Immigration. Immigration. Border. We got a little uh, guacamole. Uh, a little cartel, some salsa. I'm not, I'm not clear if it's salsa dancing or just salsa. Uh, pollution. A cruise. How come we never got anything about uh, Pierre Nieto? Come on now. Tacos? Okay, tacos are more common association than the president of Mexico. For you. This is a bad sign. Right? I think one of the things that is important to think about Mexico is that while there are these perceptions do reflect some reality, uh, it's not the entirety of the reality of Mexico, but they are what we talk about in the media. And I think the interesting thing is, a little bit later, I'm going to show you the slide of the same survey results uh, over a, a broader population survey. It's pretty much the same, right? So you all pretty much reflect what most people think about Mexico even though you've been at debate camp learning about Mexico for the last week, or at least Latin America, right? So uh, hopefully, maybe by the end of camp, I'm not probably going to do the survey again, but these words could maybe change to what we think about when we think of Mexico, right? So is Mexico a partner for the US? <clears throat> We're about half and half split here at the NGW between partner and a problem. Uh, 14 and 14. Uh, okay. All right. What do you think that does Mexico have on the U.S. economy? So, uh, these people think it's positive. It's pretty good. It's a majority think it's positive on the U.S. economy. These people think it's negative, and these think about a little bit We're pretty evenly split, I would say, on positive to eh, right? <coughs> Not negative. Did anyone say, anyone here say that the impact on the economy was positive? Why would you say that? We get uh, Mexico is our second largest uh, importer of oil. Importer of oil, yeah. And also, what else? Trent. Uh, food products. Food products. Anything else? Yeah. We export a lot of our corn and stuff to Mexico, and we import a lot of like factory made goods. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure about the corn, but that sounds right. Yeah. Labor. labor. Cheap labor. Actually. Mexico is just our second largest trading partner on everything, right? Uh, 
That includes any country in Europe. It's bigger than the entirety of the EU as a trading partner from, for the United States. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? It makes some sense though, right? When you want to trade or do business with someone, do you want them to be far away from you? Or close, right? So, uh, let's, you know, the people who think it's negative, who thought that it was negative on the US economy? Anybody want to fight in? There's some good reasons why it might be negative. spending a lot of our like money in this black market, right? That causes a lot of violence and stuff like that, right? Poverty and such. What about the cheap labor? Is that good? Yeah. Oh yeah, cheap labor. That's awesome. Let's just get the cheapest labor possible. Is that what we want for our economy? Really? What's the cheapest labor there is? No, like slavery, right? I don't know if we want the cheapest labor possible, right? <laughs> Seems a little, that's questionable, right? What if we pay them almost nothing to make all of our computers? That'd be awesome, right? Yeah, oh, that could be bad, right? What does it happen, what happens when you take all of the factories and you put them somewhere else? You, well, you distance yourself from the problem. But you lose jobs. You lose jobs, right? The people who are building cars in the U.S. are now building them in Mexico. Why? Cheaper. It's cheaper. And they can sell them for the same amount. That could be good for the economy. That could be bad for the economy, right? That's why we have rules about what we can trade. How do you feel about this lecture so far? You can go to this website. Give this little uh, feedback. We'll, we'll come back to the results in a little bit. But uh, you can uh, either rate from I don't hate it to it's amazing. At any point during the lecture. Right here, Bitly. Lecture, Mexico. Right here. Okay? We'll see how it goes. Right? I'm going to have, at some point, if, it, if, if the gauge is not going high enough, I'm going to have to ask you to pump up the volume, okay? <laughs> You need a capitalized lecture in Mexico for it to work. I love surveys. All right, so here's my goal. I'm going to do a quick history of Mexico. Uh, I think that it's very important to understand the history of Mexico, mainly because let's let's be honest. Let's let's do a quick survey in here. Has the Mexican people's interaction with the West? let's say, been awesome? How about not awesome? Okay. How about terrible? How about terrible, right? Uh, yeah. And I think that's something that's important to keep in mind. We kind of have talked about this a fair amount, and I think we'll probably talk about it a little more during our K workshop. But there's some things that are in Mexico that really the U.S. probably has no idea about. Right? And maybe it could make worse. Like, hey, let's go use these other people to make all of our stuff for cheap. Right? That seems kind of not awesome. Right? So, uh, I'm going to do this real quick. I kind of want some of the time, but I'm not going to. All right, so, start with the Olmec culture. Uh, one of the first cultures in. Uh, North America, they are around 5000 BCE, that's before the Common Era, uh, which is not BC. Can anyone know the difference? What's BC? Before Christ. Yeah, that sounds a little uh, Western, a little Judeo Christian, right? So we call it BCE now. Yep. Before the Common Era. Yep, before the Common Era. So about 5000 counts up, right? This is about. Uh, that's when it starts, it, gets, uh, it goes almost to the time of the Greeks, essentially. Aristotle, Plato, blank faces, that's fine. All right, the Maya. Who's heard of the Maya? Did the world end? Does that mean the Maya were dumb? No. 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 <laughs> that just means we're dumb. 
all right? The Maya had an incredibly complex civilization. They did math, they did all kinds of scientific things that just were not happening in the West. The West likes to pretend like, oh, the Greeks were the smartest ever. And look, I'm a Greek major. I was a Greek major in college, and the Maya were light years ahead of them. They built way better buildings, bigger ones, more interesting ones with this cool like light thing that you can do. Awesome stuff. There was this city called Tiahuichan. I can never say it. There it was. All right. Uh, this uh, was a city that was eventually, I think, brought down by the Spanish conquistadors. Awesomeness. There were also the Toltec, another Mexican civilization. There were lots of them. These are just a random sampling of some cool things that they built. Uh, but you should learn more about this. I don't really know that much. Uh, but I think that it's important to understand that there's a civilization and culture that we don't understand. And honestly, it's been kind of wiped out by Western people. And so it's maybe a little lost sometimes. So the Spanish. Who's the most famous Spanish explorer? Well, I would say Christopher Columbus. What year was that? Well, yes, I know. But he was sailing for the Yeah. Okay, what year? 1492. Okay, what were the Spanish looking for in the New World? Gold. Gold, yeah. One at a time, who's got it? Gold, what else? Spice. Spices are more, yeah. Spices are kind of going east sometimes, too, yeah. Glory. Glory. Exploration. They're looking to spread their religion. Religion, yeah. Spread some religion, yeah. Has anyone, has anyone already said money? Yeah, money. Essentially money. Things that can get them money. Right, so the Spanish conquistadors uh, established an elaborate system of colonialism. This mural here, what do you know the artist? Diego Rivera, Rivera, sorry. Uh, this is the entire history of Spanish colonialism in one mural. Uh, you got some fighting, some slavery. You got a monk reading some slavery. That's always good. Uh, buying stuff. You got the money here. <coughs> Has anyone seen this movie? Yes. Yes. I'm just watching the trailer. Let's do it. I have the values on. Yes, it is. The legend of a lost city of gold. And the two men brave enough to find it. I'm going to start over. Sorry, should have tested that. The legend of a lost city of gold. And the two men brave enough to find it. I am Miguel. And I am Tulio. And they call us Miguel and Tulio. I will give you the honor of a quick and painless death. But not with that. I'll bet we can make that. Two pesetas says we can't. You're wrong! You lose. DreamWorks Pictures invites you. Holy shit! To join two friends on an incredible journey. We'll follow that trail. What trail? To the magnificent city of gold. Toronto. Big smile, like you mean it. I actually think we're gods. Miguel and Tulio, the mighty and powerful gods. Hello. Ah, now, I'm going to need my help. What makes you think we need your help? Are you serious? They're bound for excitement. Yeah. Who's the god? You the god. 
romance hmm? and danger. I know you are not God. The Oscar winning team from the Lion King. The Road to El Dorado. Stop that! So, what is the movie about? What is El Dorado? Gold City of gold. Does it exist? No. Well, Lena. Well, okay. Does Atlantis exist? Yes. Yes. It's in Bahamas. Oh, it's Cuba. There's an F. Dude. What if they read the Cuba's Atlantis F and then you read the El Dorado Counterplan? This is going to happen now that I said it. I know that. I know that now. All right, so do you think that this movie uh, is, Who, who's seen the whole thing? I have not. How does it end? Don't. Oh, spoiler alert. Come on, who's going to spoil it? No one wants to see this movie, really. They all die. They all die? Yeah. Uh, Three more. Yeah. Uh, all of the gold goes down the five away, like the cool, cool thingy, and they escape from the average gold. Where do they go to? They just ride off into the into the sunset. Okay, regardless. <laughs> We're not watching. It. Okay, that's not what's happening. Okay. But uh, how are the two white guys, the Europeans, portrayed here? As gods. Right? And funny. Right? They're kind of good looking. <laughs> Right? They come and save the day. They ride off into the sunset, maybe. Right? How are the native people portrayed? As primitive. As primitive. Kind of evil. Right? I know you're not gods. Scary. They'll face dangers. I.e., native people. Is this what we want to think about? This is how we think of uh, Mexico when we want to engage with them. we got to control those scary, primitive other people and send our white economic engagement down there to help them and be funny and right off into the sunset with happiness. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Almost as awesome as this lecture. Don't forget to vote. You can vote multiple times. All right. I think that there's some problematic things that go on in these kind of representations, and this is just kind of the best I could find that you also would be familiar with. Uh, but I think that it's probably a little offensive in some ways, and probably is not how we should think about how we should work with as a like equal playing field with countries like Mexico, Venezuela, and Cuba. Although Venezuela, they kind of started it right yesterday. Yeah. No, they did start it. All right, so this is a map of New Spain. Uh, what do you think is maybe interesting about New Spain here? Yeah. The place called Baja California is enormous. Oh yeah, Baja. Well, yeah, it's maybe a little disproportionate. This is 1701. Yeah. Well, okay. What, what would be accurate about this map or not accurate? Yeah, okay, look, cartography is not perfect. Where are we? Texas. We're like here-ish, right? Are we in Mexico? No. Yeah, no, where we are was Mexico. That's kind of important.
important, don't you think? Has anyone ever debated like any of the teams that like give back the land? Yes? Raise your hand, yes? Uh, well, we're literally on stolen land in some ways right now. In fact, it's not that long ago that Mexico, or at least some people, political parties in Mexico, wanted to try to take back Texas. Or at least we wanted to think that they wanted to take it back, right? We've already kind of talked about Catholicism. Uh, who knows what this image is? Guadalupe, yes. It is the Virgin Mary, but it's a very particular appearance and iconography of the Virgin Mary that's particular to Mexico and Latin America. Latin America, including Mexico, is one of the most common places where there's Catholicism in the world. Do you think, is there any relationship that could have to the way that you debate or talk about these countries? What? You know, Critical it, arguments. Critical arguments? Yeah. It has no influence on policy arguments? No, I think it would. I would say it influences the way that their culture runs and the way that they would run their trade. Right, the, the way that they would run trade uh, and other types of culture. What about like public health questions? What's a big issue? Abortion, right? That's a very important issue that we might not might act would be good for the United States to have that kind of influence. Might be trying to force Protestantism on them. It's not until about 1910 that Mexico tries to break off of, or well, turn of the 19th to the 20th century, that Mexico tries to break off from, uh, from the Spanish Empire. Although I feel like I skipped Texas here somewhere. Yeah, okay. We'll go back to those other ones. All right, so this is Texas. We fought a war. We, they, not us, people who lived here before fought a war. What is this about? A cannon, yes, okay. Who took the Texas? Who's not taking Texas history yet? What is this the flag of? Yeah. Okay, the Golden Ticket flag. Thank you. Reading skills are high today. It was the Battle of a City, and they had a cannon, and the Mexican Army wanted to take the cannon. They didn't want them to take it, so they ended up burying it. Yeah. And they put the flag up, right? So it's an important iconography. What's the most important or most famous battle? Alamo. Alamo. Does anyone go to Stephen F. Austin High School? No. Does anyone go to a high school named after one of these people? Lamar. Lamar. Houston. Well, Houston's a little later, but yeah. Right? So we take this land back. And then we fight the Mexican-American War. What is this about? Texas. Disputed boundary. Did anyone know the years? Good question. Yeah. Isn't it like 1845? Yeah, I think it's 1845 to 1846. It's an important precursor to the Civil War in that a lot of the military things that we did in the Mexican-American War led up to the Civil War. How long ago was this? 160 years ago. We fought a war with Mexico. That's really not that long. If you were able to win in a debate that global warming would cause extinction in 100 years, would that be good? Yes. Yeah, that'd be pretty good. Right? Everything on the planet would die in 100 years. That's pretty fast, even. Right? This is not that long ago that we had a literal, the entire country was mobilized to fight people in Mexico. I think it's important to keep that in mind. The French also invaded Mexico after that, and the, some other Europeans. What did they? What were they fighting over? Yeah, land for trade. Land for trade. Also, my favorite of the Mexican Wars, the French invaded over pastry. Yep, it's called the Pastry War. 
Uh, there was a, a dispute over some pastry secrets, some trade secrets, and some ways that we called pastry things. That was really just the, the final straw. But they do call it the Pastry War, which is an awesome name. This literally happened. Mexico has always kind of been blessed but cursed by its relationship to the United States, right? In the sense that, yeah, they could have some economic ties, but we're going to try to take stuff from them. And in fact, we've been threatened a lot. This is, does anyone recognize this picture? Yes, Florio Diaz. Who is what? Who was he? Yeah, you said his name. Well, that was good, though. Good recognition. He was the last kind of Spanish dictator of Mexico. Who overthrew him? Well, Pancho Villa was related to that. Yes. Oh, I see it. We'll go back to this over telegram. Pancho Villa. Who's Pancho Villa? One of our pieces of evidence talked about Pancho Villa, Anderson. Oh, this guy that like was a criminal, right? He, went around. he was like a former. Person. Well, anybody else got a little more detail? Criminal? Yeah. All I quite know is it was very difficult to take him down, and it ended in a small battle between a small group of troops outside a like I could go into it, but it was a small battle. The small battle. What? Why do we want to kill Pancho Villa? He was messing with the U.S. cavalry. Yeah, he was, you know, eventually I think his end goal, yeah. He, he was stealing, I think he was stealing <coughs> mustangs, uh, illegally stealing mustangs. He was stealing horses. Doesn't this sound like a cowboy movie? A little bit? Yeah, Pancho Villa's like kind of around the time of like 1910, one of the most wanted criminals that the United States just can't get. This is kind of our Osama bin Laden of 1900. And ultimately, I think the goal would be of Pancho Villa probably to take back uh, Baja California and Mexico and other things like that by, you know, with a little army. But he was stealing some horses. Who knows, right? We're going to go back to the Zimmerman telegram. Anybody know about this? Yeah. Invade America, yeah. Well, it was just unfo well, unfortunately for Germany. Um, it was deciphered by the British, and then they told the U.S. And it's the main reason we went into the war. And Mexico even said no, so it wasn't really worth it to send it. Yeah, I got a little more detail. Germany promised to give Mexico the land back. Yeah, yeah. Germany promised Mexico, hey, if you invade the U.S. right now. And keep them busy, right? Because we don't want the U.S. to enter the war, because that will be bad for us, right? If you keep them busy down here in Texas, we'll give you Texas when we win. And California. What's California do? It was all the. It was all the. Oh wow! See, I'm learning things today too. Why was this so scary? Do we really think that Mexico is going to be able to invade and take over the United States? With the help of Germany, maybe, yeah. Just to basically keep the U.S. delayed and fighting on another front. Yeah, why do we care, though? So? Because they're right there. Because they're right there, right? And this, I think, is something that we kind of forget about a lot. Uh, has anybody <coughs> been like, uh, what's the impact to Mexico? Uh, there's no impact to this, right? We said that. Oh my god, I can't believe we have to debate about Latin America. Right? There's no like nuclear war impacts because they don't have nuclear bombs. How can we read our Colicide card? Have you heard that? Have you heard someone say this? Yeah, Jesse. We've got one honest person, thank you. Alright. Well, at least the good versions of the impact cards. Well, we're going to go over some of the bad versions of the impact cards. 
about Mexico, but the good versions assume this kind of scenario in that if the United States really had to be concerned about its southern border, it might not be able to send troops everywhere else in the world, right? Part of what helps the United States is what? That we are... Everywhere. Well, everywhere, we're but... Surrounded by we're surrounded by friendly countries, right? Like, for instance, China. China's got a lot of borders with random countries, right? Like who? Well, Russia. Yeah, they don't love, they love hate Russia. They're, they're definitely frenemies, right? Tibet. Tibet, India, right? Well, North Korea, South Korea, right? All of these countries are right there next to them. We don't have to worry about that business. Because who do we got up north? Canada? Canada. Okay, what's Canada going to do? Give us Canadian bacon. Give us Canadian bacon, that's about it. Maple syrup from hockey players. Hockey, Mounties. Look, we don't have to worry. It's not the same as having Russia as our immediate neighbor, right? Even if we're sort of frenemies with Canada sometime, like what are they going to do, like not send us some lumber? Okay? That's literally what we fight over with Canada, lumber. With Mexico, we try to... If we had to really have a military presence in Texas, that would be, A, really scary for all of us, right? And probably cause us to not want to send troops to places like Iraq, Afghanistan, maybe even Syria, right? And that's what power projection is, is being the ability and willingness to send troops abroad. Let's see a little bit. Let's get to modern Mexican history. <coughs> Does anybody know what the peso crisis is? What's a peso? Mexican it's Mexican currency. Uh, we've talked a little bit about currencies, right, when we talked about Venezuela. What does Venezuela do with their currency? Well, they control it. It's a controlled system, right? It's kind of insular. You can buy things for certain amounts. They're able to control prices that way. Uh, if they were to trade freely with the United States, if we were to, for instance, for some reason, offer them a free trade agreement in order to give up Edward Snowden, for instance. I mean, it would be a bad trade, I think, but we can imagine it, right? What would that do to their currency? It would, it would create some chaos. And that's kind of what happened when we signed NAFTA. And we opened up free trade. There's been a couple different peso crises. The most recent was in the 90s. There was another one in the 80s. But as trade gets more free, the currency in Mexico goes bazonkers. And it means that it's hyperinflated. Hyper, hyper, hyperinflated. For instance, uh, who knows what a thousand pesos is worth in U.S. dollars right now? What? No. No. No, it's like sixty or eighty. Sixty between sixty and eighty dollars. Seventy. Sixty and eighty dollars. Yes. <laughs> it, it it varies, right? Uh, it depends on your exchange rate, you know, which bank you're at. But what NAFTA did is that it made certain goods more available in Mexico, like American cheese. I don't know. Maybe not even American cheese. But American products are more available in Mexico. But that also messes with the way that their economy works, which was kind of closed before, right? So when was NAFTA signed? I'm going to give you a hand. This is signing NAFTA. And who's this? Clinton. So what year? 80s? Really? 1994. 1994. Yes. Was NAFTA easy? Yes. No. Why is free trade hard? Yeah. Yeah. But, oh, I think anyone? What's so layered? I mean, like, what kind of trade are you talking about? Are you talking about this? Are you talking about maybe the agriculture industry? 
Why might the agricultural industry in the United States be a little skeptical about trade with Mexico? Yeah? Well, one of the things about, well, for our agriculture, the thing is we have subsidies, and so we can sell things at below cost to Mexico, and that puts a lot of their rural farmers out of business because we can sell things a lot cheaper than the United States. Yeah, 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 certainly. Uh, are American farmers afraid of the same thing, too, though? Yeah. What's up? Also, with like free trade, there's no uh, protection for like agricultural like, farmers. They don't have any tariffs to protect them from the global markets. Right. Global markets create what? Competition. Competition, right? Which is bad for people who are not very good at doing what they do. But some people, you know, like look, you live in Texas. You're a farmer. You're not going to be able to grow that much because it's a desert, right? So. <coughs> This stuff might not go as well. Not, don't go corn here, really, right? But if we gave subsidies to people who wanted to grow corn, they could maybe do it. It just would be really expensive. So it kills those kind of inefficiencies. What else uh, does did I already, we already talk about about Mexico producing more cheaply than the United States? Computers, sort of. Maquila doors, automobiles. Uh, what else? What? Textiles. Textiles. All right, we've kind of gone through, let's just say agriculture and automobiles. Think about Congress. Have you ever heard of the uh, auto lobby? Yeah, well, you should have. Okay? Uh, these are groups that don't like change, right? They want to protect their industries, and they do a lot to do that. So there's a lot of things that happened in NAFTA, and they were pretty unpopular. So it took a lot of political capital. As I hear it, we can ask some of the you know, older people in the room. This is pretty good politics, this that and said. Uh, do we think that NAFTA is fully implemented? <coughs> no. Now, one of the things that we were supposed to do with NAFTA is open up American highways to Mexican trucks. <gasps> what? Aren't you really upset about Mexican trucks? Uh, some people are. What is scary about trucks coming in from Mexico? Yeah. They're bringing drugs on those trucks. Yeah, they're not. Why wouldn't they just bring them on other trucks? <laughs> I mean, yes, but that is one of the fears, yeah. I'm not sure whether this fits under human trafficking. I don't think it does, but you could fit a lot of people in a truck. You could traffic people in a truck. I mean, that is part of the fear, but people in, like, Nebraska don't want a superhighway going from Alaska down to uh, the Yucatan with massive trucks going through it. It's like a pristine America, right? And that's one of the things was this massive highway that we wanted to build. We just debated transportation, right? The NAFTA superhighway is one of the big things that isn't done yet. Well, I was just going to say, isn't there like less like pollution regulations on, like, in, in Mexico than in the US? Yeah. Uh, so if you want to build a car, say, in Mexico, you don't have to worry about the smog you create as much, right? And that's one of the things that people, when we negotiate these kind of free trade agreements, like Democrats like to say, like, hey, uh, if you're going to trade with us, you have to like meet these minimum standards a lot of times. Or like labor standards, you have to pay people so much, you have to maybe not let them die all the time in factories. <laughs> Republicans, not so much on that. There are some standards, but that's kind of the big fight about free trade. Do we put these kind of conditions right, on whether or not we trade with them? How's this lecture going? Good. You hate it? Oh, you can't even do that. Great game. Let's see. You're going to have to click out, I think, to get the actual chart. Oh, do it. Mm. Well, we'll come back at the end. It's not automatically loaded. Oh. <coughs> All right. Next. Mexico and the United States today, important key issues. This, 
is the general American public's world word cloud about Mexico. It's pretty similar, doesn't it? I have a question about the drug issue. What causes the drug trade for Mexico? America. How? We buy it. So if we were to economically engage with Mexico to try to deal with the drug problem, we should cause Mexico to have more police. What? We'll just cause some more people to die. We'll just cause more people to die. What would be the most effective way, probably? Take it over. Yeah, maybe make it not a black market. <gasps> but then they would come on Mexican trucks on a super highway. That's one of the big pieces of friction between the United States and Mexico. Pierre Nieto, the new president of Mexico, has basically said, hey, yeah, you, we don't, this is a huge problem for us, but stop buying our drugs illegally. You, sh you need to do something about this, right? If you want us to do something about the violence. He's kind of been elected on this. We're no longer just going to keep killing people in Mexico because the U.S. wants us to. Crazy, I know. Immigration. Another huge issue. Does Mexico really care? I mean, what, is, what do the people of Mexico think about the immigration reform bill? People want to come over. Eh. I mean, it's not that hard. Are they going to get paid more here? Yes. Not necessarily. What is uh, net immigration to the United States from Latin America now? Up? Down? No, it's at zero. There's no net immigration. Or at least it was a couple years ago, which was a huge difference, right? The economy's not that much better here. People have jobs. They don't want to leave. It's too risky. They've, if they've left, they've already done it. What, what, what part of the bill might be unsavory, you might say, to people in Mexico? You know, we're going to build a giant fence. What does that seem like? We're going to keep them out. Would we have maybe been better off in 1910 when Germany sent that memo? Well, telegraph, we had a big fence. Yeah, we wouldn't worry about it because we got a big fence with a bunch of 20,000 guards on it. That's literally 20,000 guards. Okay? That seems like what we're trying to do here. At least in the eyes of people in Mexico, right? What if Oklahoma built a massive fence? Yeah, it's fine, I know. I'm sorry, Gaston. You have to stay on the other side. Right? It would be really weird. Drug cartels. I've caused lots of violence in Mexico. This is a map of the location of the cartels. <coughs> There's a lot of different cartels. Any idea what the red are? It's not the names, these are the cities. The Zetas. The Zetas are kind of newish ish in the cartel game. Uh, they're known for being extremely violent. Um, and they've kind of expanded their territory a little bit. <coughs> Uh, perhaps even down into here to the Yucatan a little more. It's hard to report on the cartels. Why is that? Because yeah, they like to kill journalists. That's bad. The TPP. Another big issue. Who knows what the TPP is? Yeah. It's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a free trade. It's supposed to be a free trade agreement. It's supposed to be? What do you mean? Is it not? Well, we don't know the details because they haven't told us the details. Oh. The biggest threat to the internet you've probably never heard of. This is the best explainer video. The TPP is the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement.
TPP is a trade agreement being negotiated between more than 12 countries around the Pacific region. It has more than 26 chapters, and it covers a broad spectrum of issues, from trade of dairy, meat, textiles, and automobiles, to financial regulation, to labor regulations, and more. But one chapter poses a huge threat to the internet, the chapter concerning intellectual property. The TPP, uh, who is not included in the TPP? No, we're included. China is not included in the TPP. Is that kind of weird? Why is China not want to be a part of it? Because they're smart. Why be to industrial regulations? Yeah, I mean, there'd be regulations and stuff. What is the TPP a lot like that we were just talking about? Yeah. NAFTA. It'd be like the NAFTA of the Pacific Ocean. This is going to be one of the most important advantages on this topic for Mexico. Because Mexico recently joined the TPP. Initially, they were not a member, and we had let them in. Canada's also going to be a part of it. But people will say, I'm going to try to keep a straight face, that getting the TPP to be good and pass, which, like you said, we said, we don't know what's in it, it's not negotiated yet, is necessary to stop a war with China. How, you may ask? I don't know. It's key to the strategic balance, because, right? We gotta keep our presence in China with this dairy agreement on the internet and trade in order to balance China and Asia. Yeah, I mean, I get, it makes some sense in like, like kind of a very vague sense, but people will go very quickly in advantages from we solved the TPP to nuclear war with China. Just keep a little skepticism. I think the advantage that we're gonna write in our lab, because we're the best lab, is to say, Actually, it's better to get China to join the TPP. And China wants to trade with places like Mexico, right? They were just in Mexico. And so if we are able to use trade agreements to box out China, they'll have to join. And that's good for trade, trading with China. It would solve issues like the currency issue. China's cheating on currency. It's terrible. <laughs> Anybody know who this is? Ungato. Yeah. He's running for mayor currently. Uh, he wants to get rid of the what? The rats. Who are the rats? Yeah, the, the corrupt politicians. Uh, I guess. He can technically be on the ballot. This is Candidito Morris. Um, he's very popular on the Facebook. Um, we can watch his uh, latest ad. We can translate. This is an interview with our candidate for the presidency, Morris. What is your opinion about Javier Rafa? And your opinion about Américo Zuniga? That's what he's going to do. The bad. And what is your opinion about the actual president of the municipal, Elisa Morales? Yes. Many times. 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 I think this kind of demonstrates to a certain extent some of the political problems that are happening. A lot of advantages will say that if you Mexico trades with the United States, that'll mean that they'll be able to, re be re be able to reform the political process, remove a lot of like the corruption, bribery kind of things, and take away Candidito Morris's like support essentially because there'd be no more rats. There are no rats in America. No, right? It's way better than El Dorado. Okay. Just went down a point. Who's this? 
Pianieta, when was he elected? 2012, in November, or October, September, somewhere. A little before the U.S. election. This is the Pact for Mexico, just kind of the generic title for his entire package of reforms. What else would Nieta like to reform? We talked about it a little bit earlier. What? Drug, well, drug take. Uh, no, he wants to reform oil. What is Pemex? Anybody have any idea? It's petrol. It's a petroleum. It's a petroleum country company of Mexico. They own it. But the state does. What is that? <gasps> Communism. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They, they have some communist things there. So do we. Don't worry about it. Who would like it if oil companies in Mexico were no longer owned by the state of Mexico? Oil companies. Right? Because then they can buy it and sell it, right? What else? Uh, he's trying to reform the banking sector, which is a little messed up right now. Uh, he's also trying to reform the mobile telephone market, which is actually a really big deal. Has anyone ever heard of Carlos Slim? Who is he? Yeah, he's the richest person in the world. He owns a Mexican cell or a Latin American cell phone company. Mieto would like to make that not possible. He doesn't want to take his money necessarily. He just wants to say, like, in the future, let's not have one person or company control all of it. about this because a lot of apps are going to talk about it. It's not really a thing that people care about, but I think it's important that you know what it means. Anybody know what the NAD bank is? It's just not what it sounds like. Come on, that was funny. Any idea? Yeah. The North American Development Bank. It was developed as part of NAFTA. And what it does is it funds stuff in this region that's pictured here. Projects along the border. Uh, so for instance, what app that is in your pre-institute packet might be done by the dad bank? POE. The POE's app, right? Unfortunately, uh, for the apps that read this as their solvency actor, <coughs> Michigan, or a counter plan that might try to do that, the NAD Bank doesn't really do that right now. Uh, this is their uh, mission from their website. To serve as a binational partner and catalyst in communities along the Mexico border to finance blah, 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 for a healthy environment for citizens in the region. What they currently do is they fund environmental projects to clean up things on the border. Now. Are they supposed to maybe, kind of, could they in the future possibly do things that like build infrastructure? Maybe. But they're really kind of ineffective now at even doing this. So it'd be kind of a stretch, I think, for them to do a big kind of binational cooperative economic engagement initiative. And so I think that there's going to be a lot of these kind of alphabet soup, is what I like to call it. Like the NAD bank. There's also the NACTI or the NIFE, the N -I -N -A -I -F, the North American Infrastructure Fund, or the North American Courts of something, something, right? And people are just going to come up with more and more acronyms because there's all of these organizations that are meant to kind of cooperate. But all you need to do is Google it, figure out what they actually do. Uh, still not working. I'm going to skip the research resources for now. If you go back to this, if you go down, there's some good sites to go to. All right, debating Mexico. One thing that I've done 
is I had put up here, let's see if this will take us there. I don't know, I gotta put it here. Uh, on this really cool site called Storify. Let's go here. Because uh, I haven't embedded a link or a kind of a rich site that has the entirety of the points of entry app, including all of the articles. It's easy to find. Right? So this is the citation. You click on it. Oh, it'll take you there. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. There's some like interesting videos and stuff that you can go to, watch like tweets that I think are relevant. But I just kind of want to right now uh, talk a little bit about the Mexico relations advantage. Nuclear war. That's my graphical representation. If you really like it. All right. So. Uh, has anyone read through, besides my lab, the Mexico pre-camp app? Good, good, okay. So what would, would you say, if someone quickly summarized to me the story of the advantage? The, oh, I'm sorry, the Mexico relations advantage. Yeah. Relations are okay now, but we need to have a new initiative to make them better. Of entry is one of the key places, and those we fix problems with ports of entry, it'll spill over and to other places in relations, increasing the world relations, and then relations with Mexico is key to hegemony and power projection. Why is it key to hegemony and power projection? Because we have a huge border with them, and if they're angry, of course, we have to stop. Yeah, in the back, do you have some of that? Oh, no, I was just going to say That's what we were just talking about, right? The Zimmigrant te Telegram. You could even reference that. You'd, be, you'd sound really smart. No? <coughs> Someone here does not think that he's going to do that in debate. <coughs> Latin. Not the funny part. You think the lecture's awesome? Follow along. This is Shannon O'Neill. She's a very important person to talk about this. I'm just, I'm just messing with It's OK. Uh, she just wrote a very good book of which I, a lot of cards I have come from. Uh, there's a lot of actually really good new books on Mexico. And actually some of the best cards that I've found are from books, which is, I know, crazy, right? Who reads books? How do you cut a book? Scan it. And then what? You run it through optical pair correction and blah, 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 blah. I also just bought the Kindle version, and you can copy out of that. It's a little easier. You can also search it. I like the Kindle versions. Uh, so her new book, uh, essentially, is kind of the basis for the affirmative in a lot of ways. Uh, the next is the next kind of important part is that I'd like to point out is this Wilson Woodrow Wilson Center. You may notice, if you did a little poking around through these sites, that a lot of them come or are directed through the Wilson Center. And in my research about Mexico, I have found that I think that they are the single best resource for research and thought and commentary on Mexico. Uh, I follow them on Twitter. In fact, they followed our lab on Twitter. I was so excited about that. I know, this is the thing I get excited about. But follow us on Twitter, okay? So, that's awesome, A. And B, doing things like following someone on Twitter, following the RSS feed. I know RSS feeds died on July 1st, but they're not really dead. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Google Reader died. It's a sad day. But the Wilton Center is a very important site, particularly for the Port of Entry app, but for also lots of other types of apps and links. They have a very good site that posts all of the most recent like newspaper articles about Mexico. You don't even have to find it. Just go to their website, follow their Twitter, and they'll post it for you. I like this a lot, this graphic. Kind of wish I could put it in the 1AC. This is from the Pastor article. He's a professor. This Pastor article uh, card is one of my favorites of all time. 
In fact, I'm going to scroll down the bottom here. Let us download it. Anyone else appreciate this pastor card as much as I do? No? No? Just kind of eh? Apathetic? Dude. Wait. Just wait. I'll show you. We'll show you what happens when you don't go to be more trust. This card <coughs> says that Mexico made a ga gamble signing NAFTA. And if we continue to do things like build a huge wall to keep out Mexicans instead of working with them, they might start thinking that, like, hey, maybe China should be our friend. And Iran should be our friend, right? Or Mexico. Is it really a realistic thing to think that Iran might partner up with Mexico? No. People think it. People in Congress think it. There's a card in the security advantage from Michael McCall. Anyone from Austin? Yeah, Katie, Texas ish? He's your congressperson. He thinks that Iran is trying to partner with Mexico to smuggle nuclear weapons into the United States. Now, that could actually become likely, according to Pastor, who's pretty qualified, if we were to keep treating them like an enemy. That would eliminate the United States' ability to project its power. Okay, this is a good card. I need you to get a little more excited about how good this card is. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So yeah. 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 It's, it's a very good card. Yeah. Thank you. In fact, it's so good that we're going to skip ahead and compare it to Michigan's card. Michigan. I'm from Ohio, so. I have a particular dislike of uh, Yield, Michigan. Uh, no, go down uh, that way. All right. It's this card here. Relations solve extinction. What? Who's ready to read? Okay. Who wants to read? Can anybody, everybody see that, or should I make it a little bigger? Bigger? Is that enough? All right. Who can read? I want you to read the un-underlined parts here. Who can, who's going to read out loud? Volunteer. Yeah. Go. Yeah, just what I've highlighted here. Uh, cool. uh, diplomatic relations between the United States and Mexico have waxed and waned since our close ties during World War II. In 1941 and 1942, one could argue that the survival of our nation and ways of life mandated closer cooperation. Okay, cool. that's good. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's the card they've got. To say the same thing, they say extinction is the impact. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good lesson. Read the ununderlined parts, right? In fact, if we go back and we go to our lecture again, we can go up. I have actually linked the document here. Uh, there, oh, this guy's name's like Biff, I think. I think his little name is Biff. Let's go back. Make sure I'm right about that. Biff Baker, yeah. They didn't put his name in. First name's Biff. Biff here. Oh, they put bit in the link. Oh, okay, right. So, in, oh, that's the other one, sorry. The other one, the other one is from Cal. U.S.-Mexico Cooperation Solve Nuclear Proliferation. This is perhaps an even worse piece of evidence. Go to, why don't you go to that? All right, we'll go here. Go back. I'm going to close this one. Go. No? All right. Well, we're just going to look at this. 
They say religions solve proliferation. I pulled up their article. This is it. This is the page. If we go down, it says, hey, what? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Here. Can anyone read that? Such a scenario seems radical today, is the footnote to the key part of their card. In the footnote, he's like, yeah, some people might think that, but it seems radical to think that. But they don't cut that part. Why would the United States and Mexico be able to solve nuclear proliferation? What? Because uh, Mexico has all those nuclear weapons? Um, yeah, can't come up with it. In fact, it's not in fact what this article is talking about. What it is talking about is literally a multinational security organization like NATO. Who knows what NATO is? North Atlantic Treaty Organization, very important. Under the leadership of the Mexican military. That's what their impact scenario assumes. How likely does this seem to you? It seems, in fact, radical. <coughs> Never happened. <coughs> it's important when we're debating Mexico, people will have what I like to call the sampler impact. They're going to sample lots of little things, like, Democracy or biodiversity or proliferation or WMD stuff. All of these I think you should have a high degree of skepticism towards. Because a lot of times they're cut from really kind of weird places. I would suggest Googling it. That's like my number one suggestion in terms of debating Mexico, follow the citations up. Today, 
And those practice mates tomorrow where you're reading this app by having this 2AC today. What you're going to do, we're going to assume the 1AC was read. This is it. These are the cards you need. The 1AC. We've already looked at them. One of them is very awesome. We've determined that. Then the negative got up and read this 1NC. Seems pretty realistic. There are four arguments. These are the arguments they read on case. They made one uh, no internal link argument. And they said it was a joke. You're a joke negative. And then you have, I'm going to say you have two and a half minutes to do this. But you really should be aiming at something more like 90 seconds. Think about the 2AC. It's the most time pressured speech in the debate. And you can't be dilly dallying around on case. Who knows what you do on the 2AC on case? What do you do? What's the first thing you do? Extend arguments. Which ones? Impacts? Yeah, it could be impacts. You extend the 1AC. Two ways you forget about the 1AC are doing themselves a huge disservice. Don't forget about the 1AC. It's your most important speech. Why is that? You had infinite prep time to, to make it, and you get to choose the topic of the debate, right? When we do all these theory arguments, what does the negative say is the affirmative advantage? You know, like, oh, you're F. You get all of this time to think about it and make it as good as you want, right? If you don't talk about it later, you lose that advantage. So that's our number one goal in this 2AC is to talk about the 1AC. I have put cards in this file for the 2AC. Here's a hint, it's a trap. It's a trap. You're still gonna read them though. I know that, I just told you it was a trick. And you will still read these cards, you can't help yourself. What? my number one rule of the 2AC on case. If it's an argument that is in your 1AC and you read another part of it in the 2AC, you're like burning time. You got infinite time? No. It's a 2AC. The cards that you read in the 2AC on case should only be to things that aren't already made in the 1AC. Right? Claims that are not advanced by the 1AC. Because if you should have read that card in the 1AC, you know who should have read it? The 1A. Get faster, 1A. Get better at it. Get better at highlighting. Right? It's not my job to read case cards, it's yours. In fact, say there's a case argument that you hear in one debate and then you have to read a card on the 2AC. What do you do for the next time you're asked? Put it in the 1AC. Don't preempt it. Just put it in the 1AC. Don't let them know you know it's coming. Right? But just slide the card in there. Right? What's the most important words, two words, that you say when you're answering someone's argument from my lab? No. Answer. They say. They say. What do they say? What's, what's something they might say? No internal link. They said no internal link. Right? The 2ACM case has to be extremely organized. Yes, I know this will be difficult for the 2Ns who are creative thinkers, blah, 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 whatever. You have to let the judge know where you are on the flow, particularly on case. Because if you don't, the judge will not know what your argument is. 
Is that, a, is that good? Because the other team also doesn't know what your advantage is. Sweet, I'm not answer it right. No. The judge needs to understand the case better than anything else. That's the thing that you had to prepare, and they're comparing everything the negative says to it. So you need to know exactly where you are on the flow, and the judge needs to know exactly where you are as well. The way to do that is by saying they say. So Anderson, could you say just the words of what you would say to answer this number one? What do you mean by just the words? There are four words that you'd say. They say no impact, but, okay, five words, right? If you don't start answering arguments this way, it's going to be a bad time. Now, do you say, they say no impact, U.S. and Mexico partnership is too big to fail, areas of cooperation will always overrun the differences? No. No. Why? Because it's 2AC, you don't have time, we're not burning it. Right? That's why you have to categorize. No solvency, I've done you the favor. Will the negative always put these nice little labels on? No. Sometimes you'll have to make them up for yourself. Then what do you do once you say they say? Say why they're wrong. How do you prove that they're wrong? Yeah. Okay, so you extend some arguments. If you want to know, yeah, and try. If your card's better than theirs, you brost. You brost. This is a term that my lab has come up with. Um, it's a combination of bragging and roasting. No, bragging and boasting. Sorry, that's brosting. <laughs> it's called brosting. Uh, what you need to do is say why your evidence is good and why their evidence is bad. Right? Why is our evidence good? It's awesome. Right? There's a bad. Do you read another card then, oh, Mr. Over here? Who said that? Then you read more cards? It's a trap! Don't read more cards! <laughs> I already told you it was a trap. Don't read more cards. You're going to do it still, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Don't read more cards unless you need them. Right? What could you do instead of reading more cards on case? Explain the warrants. Explain the warrants. And then you can move on and answer their other arguments. Right? I'm giving you a lot of time to do this, but you don't need to take it all. Now, two ace have taken this to the, like, it's logical least, or to its extreme to the most illogical point, which is to say, they go, all right, uh, 2AC, we're going to answer the 1AC relations advantage. They say no impact, but we have impact. That's Brooks and Wolfhorse. They say no solvency, but we solve. That's our Lee and Wilson evidence. And then they say no impact, but we already ran an impact. And they say no internal link, but we have one. All right, next argument. Have you ever heard that 2AC before? No? No, they just extend random cards. I like to call this the Northwestern method. <laughs> It does not work. It does not work because the judge does not read your cards. Has the judge read the 1AC? No. They cannot see it. It is a secret to them. You have to explain it. You have to reveal the wonderful, mysterious secrets lying within your 1AC to the judge and the 2AC. That is your job. Any questions about the drill? Everyone is going to break up into six small groups, or to group, small groups of six. You're going to have a lab leader assigned to you. I'll post up in a second where you're going to go, right? And then you're going to give this two-minute speech, and the lab leader's going to give you some comments, and we're going to work on it together. Uh, but in order to do that, you need to read the 1AC, the 1NC. Go ahead and read the 2NC, 2AC evidence, say you're real bored. Yeah? Uh, I can't connect to the internet. We can deal with that separately. But I can jump you the file. Okay. All right. Any further questions about the drill? No? Hmm. All right. Let's check on the awesomeness scale, because I haven't been able to do it yet. How's it going? How's the lecture? Good? Bad? Yes. Good? OK. Let's see. Awesomeness. 
Oh, we're off the charts! Woo! This life in was awesome! Oh, one further thing I have for you. In order to simplify, I have made the flow, I have printed the flow of this debate, this one sheet of paper. And you can just write on it. <laughs>